I love it. I love our worship team and how they encourage us through song uh, every week. Uh, happy post-Thanksgiving, everyone. Good to be together. Hope you had a, a great Thanksgiving, uh, worshiping the Lord and celebrating with friends and family. I know for ourselves, we, we hosted a handful of people over at our house. It was fantastic. Lots of food, uh, lots of great fellowship. I do think one of the encouraging things that we did at our time was we, after stuffing ourselves, then we we actually paused and had a time to read a scripture and open it up for people to just share thanks. And so, uh, you know, there's about 20 people there, and it was just a, that was probably, apart from Son's cooking and everyone else's cooking, that was probably the highlight of the time was just to be able to hear what people were thankful for. Uh, giving glory to God and, uh, you know, thanking and expressing love uh, for one another. And so uh, I hope you had a great time. Son son cooked uh, turkey enchiladas the next day. It was awesome. And they're all gone. But uh, there's, there's something to be said about Thanksgiving leftovers, how powerfully they can be used to, uh, to encourage Uh, Great being here together this morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm grateful that we have another day that we can worship God. If if you're visiting for the first time, I really want to thank you for being here and uh, being part of our worship today. I hope that God ministers to you, and uh, I don't know where you're at spiritually, but I trust that God's Spirit will absolutely, if, if you open up your heart and your mind and hear His voice from His Word, He will absolutely deepen your convictions. He will empower you. He will help you to be the man or woman that you are destined to be. But thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, worshiping with us. If you're a family from out of town, it's, uh, it's certainly great to have you here. Thank you for staying for worship and, and all that. It's great to see uh, an old friend from the Philippines, uh, Cynthia and her son. Cynthia was actually converted uh, in the Philippines as a result of the mission team that was uh, uh, planted back in 1989. And it's great to see the faithfulness over the 30 plus years and so it's a great surprise visit from her and her son they live in san diego now part of the san diego uh, church of christ let's turn our bibles over to romans we have been studying the book of romans for some time as we know and we're going to take uh the rest of these sundays and even some of our midweeks to finish up the 16 chapters of the book of Romans, we've been looking at a theme called set free because this is what God does for you and for me. We are not capable of setting ourselves free. We need a mediator, we need God to be able to do that. Just in quick summary, the first 11 chapters that we've covered talked so much of the teachings, the doctrines of Christianity about God the theology, which really just talks about the nature of God, the character of God. We learn how to be saved. What is it required to be saved? And it, salvation does not come from us, but salvation comes from Jesus Christ. Chapters 12 through the rest of this book are all practical applications. How do we take what we've learned and actually apply them into our lives? How do they gain traction for us? And last time we talked about being all that God wants us to be and being the church that God wants us to be. Today we're going to talk about something that I have never really preached about in its entirety, but I think it's necessary for us, and perhaps you've never even heard a lesson in in this area, but I'm going to talk about government today. You know, what is your view of government? I'm not going to solicit hands right now or... But how do you feel about it? How much do you think about it? This is a hot topic. This is a hot theme. And if you've noticed, our government here is under a lot of stress, a lot of duress. Our president is under a lot of scrutiny, incredible scrutiny. Our government leaders seem to be more vocal than ever before. Uh, There seems to be more division happening in our country today. Uh, We are at a crossroads in many areas of what our country even believes in or stands for. 
And some of us uh, here in the church, we, we are more up to date on what's happening in our government, in our leadership. And that's fine. Some of us, we don't really choose to follow what's happening in the government or in politics. As, as disciples, I want to encourage you to at least be aware. Be aware of what's going on in our country. You know, view the news, but when you view it, view it through the eyes of God. Try to view the news through spiritual lenses and to see what's happening. See the spiritual war that's taking place. See the good and evil that may be taking place. But see things. Don't, don't tune yourself out. As disciples, we are actually called to save people in the world, to save those around us who don't know about Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you not to, not to pull away from what's happening. Be aware of what's happening in our world today. I do want to make a special note. I've never been a preacher who has brought politics into the church. And I don't intend to. However, I do believe God calls me and all of us to at least be concerned and aware of what's going on in our country. And I do believe that the topic of, of government should be discussed in a biblical way because the Bible talks about it. Uh, in, in, no, in no scripture or passage is government talked about all at once. We actually have to look at a number of different passages to help make sense of all these things. And I don't, and I don't know where you stand, and I don't know your, your lean. That, that doesn't really matter today because I want us to be able to talk about God, me, not me, but you and me, and the government. And to address these things biblically and by all means, I'm not saying that I'm an expert in all these things, but I do want us to be able to at least dive into some scriptures that can enlighten us. Enlighten us to make sense of what's happening in our life, what's happening in our world today, and using the scriptures as a backdrop to help us make decisions as individuals as we move forward. So in Romans chapter 13, we see the Apostle Paul addressing us, starting in verse 1. And today what we're going to look at, give you a, a, kind of a heads up of where we're headed here. We're going to talk about the nature of government, what scriptures talk about that, then we're going to talk about the purposes of government, and then we're going to end by talking our responsibility towards government. That's where we're headed, guys. Let's start reading. Chapter 13, verse 1 through 7. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what's right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. There's a lot here, and there's a lot not here. I want to talk about just the whole nature of government, the principle of government. And the first thing that we learn from scriptures, according to verse 1 and 2, is that government is part of God's purpose. It's part of God's purpose. It's divinely appointed by 
God. The Bible says that God has established government. Okay? Just like God has established marriage. That's from God. That doesn't mean that all marriages are doing what God wants it to do. But God established marriage. God has established governing. He established laws. He established boundaries. He established government. Doesn't mean that a country's government is doing what God is pleased with. But let's understand that God established government. He says, consequently, he who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Now, note this, that God doesn't say any specific form of government. And so we have to not only take what the Bible is saying and try to apply it to our life now, but we also have to have in context of perhaps what Paul was living under as well. Uh, the fact is, there's going to be some better governments than others in different countries. The Bible isn't specifying which government. But the principle of government is established by God. No human government is ever perfect. It's never perfect, brothers and sisters. When Paul was writing these things, he wasn't under a democracy. He was under the Roman rule. We have to take this in light of how he was even writing these things. He was writing to the fellow believers and Christians in Rome, the capital city there of the Roman Empire. Even Jews had difficulty submitting to the Roman law. There was a, a, a group of Jews that we're familiar with called the Zealots. The Zealots were anti-Roman government. Part of their nature was to not pay taxes. They would even burn the homes of people who would pay taxes and burn their crops. They were an anti-government group. They were radical fanaticals. Their mission was actually to kill and murder Roman leaders. This is when Paul was writing this letter. You know, these zealots were known as the dagger bearers because they carried that sword. If you read a little bit about of Roman history, and even when Paul was existing and the Christians were there and the great persecution of the Christians hadn't taken place yet. It was going to be in the future. But Paul was writing this about submitting to the authority when Nero, a man by the name of Nero, was in charge. Uh, this, this was a wicked ruling family. Uh, Nero was not Mr. Rogers and his neighborhood. Far from it. Nero had a mother named Agrippina, and this woman had the stepfather of Nero assassinated with a dish of poisoned mushrooms. That's not a good Thanksgiving dinner right there. <laughs> Nero himself killed his stepbrother named Britannicus, 14-year-old stepbrother, and also his own mother, and also banished his first wife, Octavia, to an island and had her murdered. Nero then murdered his second wife, Popea. This guy was ruthless. The Roman Empire was very pagan and, and merciless during that time. They were turning into a giant welfare state where most of the citizens were depending more on the government than on taking care of themselves. The Roman leaders positioned themselves to be gods and they expected people to worship them. How would you like to be under this leadership? It gives us a little bit of perspective for us even today. There are people who have lived under far worse governments than we've ever experienced. But the Bible calls Christians to submit. Because it's established by God. That's the first thing we see about the nature of government. And I'll talk more about submission here in a moment. The second thing we see from the Bible, government leaders are servants of God. 
you know, for the rulers hold no terror for those who do what's right, for those, you know, for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of one in authority? Then do what's right, and he will commend you, for he is God's servant to do you good. Now, if you're employed by the government, you may have not realized it or not, but God, you're God's servant. You're meant to do good for people. You're a servant of God. People who are employed by the government today, whether it be our city officials to police officers to, again, government officials, whether people are saved or not, they are still God's servants to do good for people. And that's what it talks about. Uh, throughout the old, old Testament, I've listed some different scriptures there for you. You're going to have to look them up. I've got scriptures for you today that we're not going to read all of them. You're going to have to do some homework and, and read them yourselves and get some conviction yourself. But throughout the Bible, God helps us see what, what godly leaders should be like, what kings should be like. What, they should, what qualities and characteristics they should possess. It says that in Deuteronomy 17, Psalm 72, Isaiah 10. Let me read this in verse 1 through 3. Woe to those who make unjust laws and those who issue oppressive decrees to deprive the poor of their rights and rob my oppressed people of justice, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your riches? Nothing will remain but to cringe among the captives or fall among the slain. God expects people in authority, people that are connected to governing other people, he expects them to take care of people. He expects them to look after their welfare. He expects them to do what's good. And they may not have you know, the rights or the privileges that are being spoken up, a voice. That's what authority and leadership should do. They're God's servants. That's what we see from the Bible. The third thing that we see from the Bible is that government is temporary. A couple passages I've got listed for you, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. It alludes to the fact that all human forms of authority are going to be abolished one day. All dominion, all authority, all power that we know of here on earth, of every government of every country, it is all going to be eliminated one day. It will be destroyed when Jesus comes back. Because there will be no greater authority than Jesus Christ. He possesses all authority in heaven and on earth. Government as we know, the governing laws, the boundaries and everything like that will be eliminated one day. Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11, talks about how every knee is going to bow to the name of Jesus Christ. Every tongue is going to be able to confess that Jesus is Lord. Whether someone is saved or not, every human being, when they die and they face God, will know that Jesus was real. Will know that Jesus is Lord. Will know that heaven and hell are real. Will know that their sins are forgiven. Jesus is king of all kings. No matter what form of government, this is the nature of government. It's temporary. It's not going to be here forever, guys. How do I know that? God says that. So now we know some of the things about the nature of government. Let me, let me move on to the purposes of government, okay, and what the Bible alludes to. And there are different reasons why God established rules and governing and boundaries you think about when the israelites were a people of god it was chaotic and god had established different laws and regulations so the people would actually be under control but one of the, the reasons and the purposes of government number one is to protect human life even back in genesis chapter 9 when god was making a covenant with noah wiped out the whole earth because he saw that all of mankind was just filled with evil, evil thoughts all the time. So God eliminated that generation. And he made a covenant with Noah. And that's what's, what's cool today, guys. That, that rainbow is the covenant sign. We should be reminded of God's covenant with Noah all the time when you're driving over the H3. 
I remember one time when he first moved here, we're driving up to Mililani, and uh, there was this double rainbow, and it looked like it was landing on the H2 going up to North Shore. And I, I, I know it's illegal, but I took my camera, and I, I, I took a picture. I was so amazed at how the colors were so vibrant. But it just reminded me of the covenant that God had made with Noah that he wasn't going to wipe out mankind again in that similar fashion. But God made that covenant with Noah, and he established even the the concept of governing authorities. And he makes this statement. He says, whoever sheds, in verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, God has made man. God was establishing government to protect life. Life was valuable to God. And he's talking about capital punishment here. Someone kills someone, they get killed. I'm not going to go into this right now. But we see how God dealt with sin. We see how he dealt with it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. And in our day and age, people are murdering people all the time. Deuteronomy 17 alludes to the fact that we've got to purge evil out of the community. This is how God's people dealt with evilness. They purged it out. It was identified and it was purged out. Some people were stoned to death. I'm not saying we do these things. But the fact that it's in the Bible shows us, I think there's a level of righteousness that we've got to elevate ourselves in. There's a level of of godliness that we might not be touching as individuals or even as a community when it comes to making sure the church family is pure, making sure that we're doing our part and living under God's expectations, but protecting human life. I don't have the right to take someone else's life. Now, the government does. We see that being set up even biblically, starting in the Old Testament. I think another purpose of the government is to protect personal and property rights. Exodus chapter 20, you see, again, some of the Ten Commandments that were listed out there. Don't steal, okay? Don't don't rob people. Don't take from other people's, like, property. Don't commit adultery. Stay within your marriage. If you stay within your marriage, then life is going to go a whole lot better. Don't steal somebody's husband. Don't steal somebody's wife. Don't covet other people's things just because you don't have what they have. Don't, like, be envious where you steal. Don't you get the impression that if we just did it God's way, our world would be a little bit better? Do you think, you think if society just actually looked at the Bible for its legislation? In practice, this is what we emphasize in schools. This is what we emphasize in our communities. This is how we practiced our own lives. Our world would be a better place. But the Bible sets it up. It's meant to protect government, protect personal and property rights. Even the Ten Commandments were legitimizing this. Don't steal from the cookie jar. Put your hand back or I'll cut it off. I think a third purpose. Government's meant to handle disputes amongst other people. Even in Moses' time, he was overwhelmed by the amount of millions of Jews that he was leading out of Egypt. And uh, he was having conversation with God. You can read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 1. But Moses basically says, how can I bear the problems and the burdens of these people and and have disputes all by myself? And the direction was to choose, you know, some wise men and understanding, respected men from each of the tribes, and I'll set them over you. So even God was helping to set up a judicial system right here for judges to be able to bring, have cases brought to them where they could be making decisions 
about the, the outcome of someone's life or someone's property, a judicial system was already being built. So that's another purpose of government, is to handle disputes between people. The fourth last thing that I want to point out of one of the purposes of government is to punish lawbreakers. Punish lawbreakers. We read about in Romans 13, he's God's servant to do you good, but if you do, you know, if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. There's another passage in 1 Peter 2 that is also helpful about submitting to authorities. The government has the right and the responsibility and the authority to punish lawbreakers. See, I'm not just talking about the government here in the U.S. I'm talking about any government over every country. They've got that authority from God. I don't know how you're receiving all these things. Uh, I don't know what kind of thoughts are going through your mind. What I, what I do want to be able to do today, brothers and sisters, is to empower us more from the scriptures, how we need to view some things. How we need to view our lives, about God, about ourselves, and about how we relate to the government. Not only understanding the nature of the government, but then understanding the purpose behind it. Why does God, why is he supporting governing rules? Whether they're done correctly, or they're not done correctly. The last section I want to talk about here is our responsibility towards government. And there's a relationship that we have to have as well. But what is our responsibility in relationship to government? Number one, I want us to understand that we are actually, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you are a citizen of two different worlds. I love the passage in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul talks about how our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul helps to remind us that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're not just a citizen of whatever country you might be residing in. You're actually a citizen of heaven itself, the world of God. You're a citizen of two different worlds, the country you're in and in heaven. And it's interesting, even that word citizenship, that's where we get the word politics from, which is a very interesting uh, understanding. That's where we get the word political or politics from this word citizenship. God is saying our politics are not down from below. The way we operate in heaven is not done the same way that you see earthly government handling things. Ephesians 2 verse 19 says, Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you've been called out of the world, you've been called out of that life of darkness, you've been called to live a born-again life, and when you get baptized, you repent of your sins, the sins of your life get forgiven, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. At that moment in time, you are no longer just a citizen of whatever country you might have been born in. You are now a citizen that's now been born into the country of heaven. And you now have citizenship. You've got dual passports, perhaps. But you are a citizen of two worlds. You have double allegiance to your country, to God. That's how we got to view these things. How, how do we keep these things in focus? I love how Jesus is able to balance these things and put things into clarity. There's a great story in Luke chapter 20, verse 22. And uh, Jesus tells us how to keep this different citizenship in balance. And there were some Pharisees, these uh, religious leaders of the Jews, they were trying to trick Jesus during the time. And the Bible says they came to Jesus and said, is it not right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And 
scriptures say that Jesus saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a coin, show me a denarius whose portrait and inscription is on it. And they, they simply said, it's, it's Caesar's. And then Jesus said to them, well, then give to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what's God's. And they knew that. They, they read between the lines. They understood what Jesus was saying. I mean, what, 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 uh, what belongs to Caesar? Well, taxes, this denarius, because it's got an inscription to it. Well, what belongs to God? And they knew what Jesus was alluding to. What belongs to God is, is your life, your allegiance, your obedience, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength because God is inscripted on you. God made you in his image. And so, yeah, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but hey, are you giving to God what you owe God? Are you actually giving your life to God? Are you loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you, are you worried about civilian affairs or are you actually dedicated, committed, to the Lord, where no longer are you letting sin hold you back, but you are deciding, I am going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I have nothing worth more living for than for God. Give to God what's God's. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. We're in two worlds, brothers and sisters. That's our responsibility. Number two. I think our responsibility, number two, is our, our primary obedience is to God. I've been talking about this throughout this morning. Regardless whether our government is good or bad, or doing what's right, or doing what's good, if you're going to follow Jesus, then your primary obedience is to God, there's some great passages that you're going to have to go back and read in Acts 4 and Acts 5. It's about the disciples and how they dealt with the authorities during the time. But the apostles of Jesus had been preaching in the city of Jerusalem, and they, they filled the whole city with the teachings of Christ. And the religious authorities, the Sanhedrin body, got word of all this, and they brought the disciples in, and, and they, they warned them, hey, you've got to stop preaching this news about Jesus Christ. You, you are no longer uh, uh, allowed to speak in his name. And I love what Peter and John replied to in, in Acts chapter 4. He said, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we've seen or heard. You know, even though the government was saying one thing, the disciples had a greater obedience towards God to do another thing. They weren't going to stop preaching about God because that was disobeying the Lord. They needed to share the good news despite what the governing authorities were saying. It leads on to chapter 5, verse 27 through 29. The Sanhedrin gives them strict orders not to preach. They filled the city with the teaching and determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. This was direct defiance to what the government was saying, the government leaders. I'm not saying that, you know, we, I want you to leave church defiant today. No. I think God wants us to balance all this out so we can make sense. How do we stay Christians? How do we stay Christians in whatever country we're in? We could be giving this lesson to brothers and sisters in the Middle East. And they're called to submit. We could be giving this lesson in Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world. The disciples are still called to be citizens of two worlds. The country they live in and heaven itself. Our primary obedience is to God. Number three, obey the law whenever possible. Titus 3 verse 1 says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and to be ready to do whatever is good. And I, I say obey the law whenever possible because 
there may be times, and I want to say, first of all, I'm grateful to live in a country where we have freedom to express our convictions. I'm grateful for what we have. It's not guaranteed we're going to have it forever. But I'm grateful we have it. And, and you and I can, can bring our Bible to a Starbucks. We can, we can go out. We can invite people freely here on the streets. We can talk about God in many places here in our society. And we're not going to be put in jail for it. There are other brothers and sisters who endure these types of environments and have to persevere through this type of society. All I can say is when I think about other brothers and sisters who have it worse off than we do when it comes to freedom to be able to express our conviction, it, it gives me all the more reason why I cannot stop sharing the good news. I cannot be some comfortable American Christian who just sits on my couch all day and I'm talking not just physically but spiritually, but doesn't get out and see the world and its lostness. And we don't see people dying and hurting and, and, and needing salvation and needing God, and, and we're not willing to change so we can do something about it. And I have a conviction that the older we get, we've got to get more excited about Jesus Christ. That means you're getting closer to dying and going with him to heaven. Doesn't that excite you? Not the dying part, but being with Jesus in heaven. But brothers and sisters, this, this is such a key. The older we get, I believe, the more zealous we should become, the more convicted we should become as men and women of Jesus Christ. And we shouldn't let our relationship drift with God. We shouldn't let our mission or our purpose or why God saved us in the first place wane on the sidelines. We have the greatest message. And God expects us to use it. And we've got to obey, we've got to obey God. We've got to obey God whenever it's possible. Why, does, why do we need to do that? Because the Bible talks about it. Let me, let me go through four quick bullet points here. Why do we need to obey? Why do we need to obey the law? One, God established the authority. I, I talked about that in Romans chapter 1 already. Or 13 verse 1. Submit. Everyone must submit himself. This word submit is a military term. It means to line up under the authority of an officer. This is not an option. This is a command. And it is not done for you. You have to do it voluntarily. There has to be a surrendered spirit in your heart to respect the authority that God has established. You are willingly placing yourself under governmental authority. The Bible is calling you and me to do that. It's voluntary. We are meant to subject ourselves and submit ourselves to higher powers that have been established by God. And it's regardless whether you like the leader or not. Regardless of who's president, who's congressman, congresswoman, you may not agree. And more than likely, you're not going to agree with everything. Have you noticed that we don't always get our way? Have you noticed that? Okay, in school, you may not have gotten your way. I don't want to take that test. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, if you want to go to the second grade, you're going to have to take that test. You, you might not have gotten what you wanted on a sports team. I wanted to play this. Well, we need a good water boy right now. <laughs> you might not have gotten everything you wanted, even in church. But God has established authority in family, in government, in church, in schools. There has to be a spirit that comes from all of us if we're going to be responsible. There has to be this spirit of submission. And it does. It connects with our commitment and our closeness with God. 
if God calls us to trust him and trust what he's established, then we can do it because it shows our trust and our strength in God. And God has established these things, whether it's government, church, home, business, school authority. Children are to honor their parents just because they're your parents, whether they've treated you well or not. God expects us to respect the position, respect the authority, regardless of whether they're doing good or bad. Wives are to honor their husbands. Husbands and wives are called to submit to one another, whether your wife or your husband is meeting your needs or not. You are called to get in line. And for some of us, that's tough. It's tough. We don't like authority. We don't like people telling us what to do. And it's tough. But see, that's where it's connected to your connection with God. And if you can see that and you can bridge that and you can make that connection, then it's going to make you a better person moving forward. When a soldier salutes, he's saluting not just, he's not, you know, he's saluting the uniform. Perhaps not just the person in the uniform because that person in the uniform, he might not like. He might not like her. But there is submission, a respecting of the position that God has established. Let's move on and let's close up here. Another thing that we see why we need to obey is we just need to obey the law for our own good, okay? Verse three and four of chapter 13, rulers hold no terror and those who do right, for those who do right and those who do wrong. You know, you and I don't need to fear the police if we're driving 60 miles an hour and below. Now, if we're doing that in a school district, then that's not good. You're, you're going to be in trouble there. But if, if you drive 75 miles per hour and all of a sudden you see, you know, some, some multicolor lights going on in your rearview mirror, then you've done wrong. Okay? Brother Kevin Ancog is going to pull you over and he's going to, you know, slap your hand as a brother or sister. He's going to give you a hug. He's probably going to let you go. Okay? But you, you have done wrong. You, you, and, and this is, this is part of it. Obey the law for your own good. Don't be a troublemaker. Do what's right. If you do what's right, then you don't have to fear the authorities. They're there to punish wrongdoers. Have you ever noticed that? I slow down when I see a police officer coming down the H2. And they're in the most secret places right there. I tell you, man, they got their radar gun. And I, you know got to slow down my Toyota Echo. <laughs> Number three, why do we need to obey the law? Maintain a clear conscience. Honestly, if you just do what's right, your conscience stays more clear. If you're, if you're scheming how to do what's wrong, then you, you've got a, a hardened conscience. And, uh, you know, be, 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 be forewarned. I mean, if you do wrong, there are authorities that are going to punish you. And you don't need to fear if you're going to do what's right. Fourthly, main a good testimony. Okay, that's why you need to obey the law. You're going to have to read these stories in Daniel. These are great stories on how you had some incredible godly men who lived in a pagan governing society. And yet they didn't compromise their convictions. Daniel and his three friends were called to eat a certain diet and they chose not to but they chose that you know that's where we get the Daniel fast from and they chose to just eat vegetables and they they turned out better than the royal officials uh, Daniel was even there was a dictate that came out later where hey you needed to you know bow down to this idol and worship this idol and Daniel refused to he was willing to go into the lion's den for his convictions he was trusting God enough that he wasn't willing to compromise his convictions even under the government he was submitting to. When a government tells you to do something that's not of God, then we see an example of a godly man not abiding with it. 
Later on, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, same thing. They, they were called to compromise their convictions, but what they were willing to give up their lives into the fiery furnace before they were willing to compromise with God. Great stories. You're going to have to read it on your own. Number four, why do we need to obey the law? Got to pray for public officials. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 3, talks about that request, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God. God calls us and our responsibility to actually pray for our government leaders. I mean, how often do you pray for President Trump? Or Mike Pence, our vice president? Or even our city officials, or our state officials? Do we know them? Governor Ige, Lieutenant Governor Doug Chin, Our senators, Brian Schatz, who's the other one? Maisie Hirono, <laughs> right? Congress people, <laughs> Tulsi Gabbard, right? Tulsi and Ed Case, Whew. okay. That shows me I, I have not been praying. I have not been praying for our leaders the way I believe God has put on my heart to be able to pray for them. That is our responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ. Why, why? Well, it says so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. Pray for decisions, pray for, pray for them to make the right decisions. Pray for them to be led by God. Lastly, pay your taxes. Okay, verse 6 and 7 of Romans. Pay your taxes. Don't avoid taxes. If you've been, if you've been not paying your taxes for years, then, then and maybe that's what you get out of this lesson today. I don't know. Tax evasion is wrong, okay? Pay your taxes. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. We're supposed to pay our taxes. It's part of our duty as disciples of Christ. Give respect. Where's respect is, is, is man honor those types of things give people the high esteem. We're, we're all obligated to the government to pay for taxes because we benefit from them. I, I don't know where all our taxes, even on the state level, goes, okay? Education goes to education to help educate the children here in Hawaii. Okay, I know we need more air conditioners in all the, the, the schools. I know that. I've heard that. We get to benefit from that, okay? We get to benefit from the parks and, and recreation department that we have. Uh, I don't even know, again, I don't know where all our taxes go and how much is spent, and we might not even agree with everything that's gone, but we have to submit. We've got to be able to submit. If you don't like it, then go vote. Right? Go vote someone out. That's a right that we have right now in our country. I'm going to summarize things here, guys. You guys still with me here? Let, let's bring things, let's land the plane. I hope we have a better understanding of God, us, and the government. And that we see from scriptures, and we understand biblically some of the different principles and practicals that we need to be able to have in order to kind of make all this make more sense. I wish we had more disciples in government. And then we could see more people being influenced for God. I'm thankful for Doug Chen being there because he can help influence in the right direction. But there's some things I, I want us to take away here. Number one, don't confuse America or any other country with the kingdom of God. Jesus said in John chapter 18, verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. Don't confuse it. Don't confuse any government with the kingdom of God. And the problem that we have in our world is not because we need more legislation or we need more laws or we need more boundaries. The problem in this world is because people have stopped 
loving and honoring God. That's why we've got the problems. It's because people have forgotten where they've come from, who created them, who they're meant to live for. And don't mess it up. Don't confuse it. If we really want to influence society, then people are going to change ultimately, not because of more rules, not because of more laws, but because of Jesus Christ. That's ultimately how people are going to be changed. Is understanding the salvation work through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So don't confuse the government we're under now with the kingdom of God. Secondly, be a model citizen. Be a model citizen. First, if you're not a disciple, then get your citizenship, get it right. Get your citizenship right first and foremost with Jehovah God. You might still be a citizenship of whatever country you might be living in. Most of us were here in the United States. But if you're not a citizen of heaven yet, the Bible tells you how to be able to do that. Become a citizen of heaven first if you're going to be a model citizen. And then put these other things into practice. We've got to be able to claim allegiance not only to our country, the United States of America, but more importantly, to the country of heaven. Then lastly, make disciples. Make disciples, guys. God has not called the church to be political. That is not the purpose and mission of God's chosen people. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. We are called to be a church that doesn't entangle ourselves into the civilian affairs of this world but we are commissioned by Jesus Christ to be the church that shares the good news of him. We've got the greatest message ever in hard copy, on your phone, what, whatever medium you use. You, you've got the message, brothers and sisters, but that's where we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to be involved in helping people, opening up the Bible with people, sharing the good news of Jesus with other people. We've been talking about this for years. And when you decide to get involved, when you decide to put yourself out and go into deep waters, God will bless it. Make disciples. That is what God is calling us to do. I wanted to end by showing four precious souls that God has saved over the last few weeks. Let's show some pictures. The first one here is our sister Kim Fattrell. What a beautiful picture that is. Love it. Appreciate, no, 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 let's, no, no, I'm not done. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate Kazu and Audrey and their family sharing with Kim in Japan while they were both stationed over there and several years ago. And then Kim and, and her family, Sean right there to the, to, the, to the right of Kim and then their daughter Haley. They moved to Ohio for uh, about a year. Kim got a job out here in Hawaii at Tripler and, and uh, then soon after her husband Sean and Haley followed uh, within the year and they're all here right now but uh, Kim studied the Bible for several months uh, and I'm so encouraged you know her her new life and what God has done but I'm also encouraged by what's what God's doing with her husband's life and her and their daughter's life it's it's a wonderful thing to see families being united in the Lord it's it's awesome amen okay we can go to the next one Ashi Kauchi so grateful for the Kauchi family, for, for Dean and Leilani and Blaze. They're, they're kind of in there in that group right there in the center. And then Ashley is the one with the towel. Uh, but but I, love, I love the fact what God has done with her life, with the Kauchi family and the encouragement that God has brought there. What God's doing to the families here in the Oahu Church and, and giving hope and how kids, kids at younger age can actually make decisions for Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing. Let's go to the next one. Our third. This is uh, Tarina Narapo. And uh, that's, that's, uh, that's her mother, Cree, and her dad, 
Sam, uh, Tarina, Naropo. I, I know I'm not pronouncing it the best way I can, but the Lord knows because the name's written in the book of life. But I love the fact that, you know, Tarina was away in Turkey for several years and then moved here to Hawaii. Uh, she's in the military. She's here at least for another three years. But I'm thankful how God has reunited them to be here on the same island. Uh, let's look at the next picture. This is the Ohana group uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, we can clap. Okay, we can clap. This is the Ohana group. But I, but I love this because, guys, it takes, it takes a whole community of support to run this race. It really does. Uh, but I love the fact. Tarina is full of zeal and joy. And she, she like, set up, like, most of her Bible studies with the Christians. She's the act, actually the one that initiated with the Christians, like, when is my next study? When are we going to do it? That's like a poster child of someone who's studying the Bible, who wants to study the Bible. I love that spirit and that zeal and that hunger to go after. She knows what she wants, and she's going to go for it. I love it. Let's look at the next scripture. Our last soul that's been saved... Sharon, Sharon Mokiao and uh, the daughter of Wainani, uh, what a, a great story this is. You know, Randy and Wainani, that's a, that's a story in and of itself. But then to see Sharon become a Christian uh, later in life, uh, what, a, what a victory for God, what a victory for Sharon, victory for the family. And these two women, what, what encourages me is how these kids didn't make a decision of becoming a Christian while they were still under the roof. They became Christians after they'd left the house. And they saw, by their own convictions, what the world doesn't offer, but they saw what Jesus offered. That gives, that gives me so much hope for all of our families in the Oahu Church of Christ, guys. I love these souls being saved. This is, this is God's work doing incredible things. Let's be different people, okay? God, me, and government, let's look at things with a different perspective. Let's go out of here empowered to be great citizens for the Lord. Let's make disciples for Jesus Christ. Amen. Congrats on everybody. I just got baptized. Congratulations. I think my reflections on the lesson is, I think my view and respect on government can be used by God to really help others come to know him and get closer to him. Uh, just by the way, I, I'm able to talk about it and my respect towards but mostly how I obey God in the light of what he's established with authority. So I think that's what stood out for me. I'm just grateful for the word of God providing the room to be able to get clarity and then have discussion on it, on these kinds of topics that I I cannot really find clarity on the world in the world. I mean, growing up, I, I didn't know what to think about government. When I came to the scriptures, it helped me. So thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you so much, God, for providing clarity. Amen. All right, real quick, I got some announcements. There's an event coming up at the Weinberg Village. Um, there's a table back there. If you want to be able to contribute to this event where we're creating like a shop atmosphere at the Weinberg. You can donate gifts and it's going to be a time to just give back to those in need. There's a table back there for the next three Sundays. Uh, also, Campus in Singles, we're having a party on December 8th, 5 to 10 at Pro City Peninsula Rec Center. So please stay attentive to um, your ministries with that announcement. And then lastly, we have midweek, um, this Wednesday, November 28th at 7.30, Pro City Country Club. Have a also also UH. We're back here next week. Before I leave, we do have some new births in the in the church. Yeah. Do I have pictures? This is Peter, <laughs> Matt, and Tam. And then this is Kalani, Kalani Dobson from Kavika and Thai. So praise God for the, oh, and then the Mooks had their baby too. Wow. What is his name? Riley. Riley. Introducing Riley, everybody. Praise God. Thank you for the great time. All right. Let's stand. We're going to close.